term spoiler has been around for quite some time. It refers to the reveal of crucial information, including plot twists, from a piece of media. I have a feeling we know all this, but I'm going over it anyway. If you're excited to see a movie and naturally uncover plot elements for yourself, it can be very disappointing to find them out beforehand, especially if your co-worker Neville just happens to blurt them out of the water cooler. Fucking Neville. The thing is, people want to discuss the latest movie, TV episode, or less commonly, book, with friends who are also in the know. So the polite thing to do, especially online, is to post a spoiler alert to warn off casual interlopers. I used to be very much a part of the fandom for a popular series of books. For the most part, this community was very respectful about spoilers, especially considering the staggered release dates for Australia, the US, and UK. The Facebook pages, forum threads, and DeviantArt posts were often adorned with spoiler warnings, continuing for many months, if not years, after the release of a book. Oftentimes, the spoilers themselves were concealed and required the pressing of a button to view them, just to make extra super sure nobody got an accidental peek. Even I was careful, choosing not to include certain plot elements for extended periods of time. I was something of a big-name fan, not that it got me any more attention for my original works, but there you go, fans are fickle. So this is all to be expected from a bookish fan community as relatively small as this. It was all very considerate. However, there is an unspoken rule that, for media that's been out for a very long time, any discussion of details of the plot are fair game. For example, the movie Psycho from 1960 is a considered classic. At the time the film was being promoted, a no late admissions to the theatre policy was implemented by Hitchcock, because the starring actress Janet Leigh is killed in the first 30 minutes, and people would probably want to see her. Hitchcock did his very best to prevent the details of the plot getting out. No interviews with the actors, no advanced screenings for critics, and a host of other measures. An important scene took place in this room. There was a private supper here. And, uh, oh, by the way, this picture has great significance because... Uh, Let's go along to cabin number one. I'll show you something there. The Master of Suspense. In 2018, it's hard to discuss Psycho without going into Norman Bates's particular psychological issues involving his mother. Most everyone watching will already know the plot twist, and surely that's fine, isn't it? The movie's almost 60 years old, and if you haven't seen it by now, that's your own fault. This is the common consensus. It's curious to me because there still exist young people who are just beginning their film studies. How many of them will get to see Psycho before the plot is spoiled for them? Everyone and their mother has parodied the shower scene. Neville will tell you all about Norman and his mother. Fucking Neville. There's an argument to be had that knowing these things going in will diminish the viewer's enjoyment and deprive them of the opportunity to unwind the mystery for themselves. But I'll get to that later. Psycho is a classic, and classic films are going to be referenced, parodied, and as those things imply, spoiled. Media that are so aged and so firmly embedded into public consciousness are fair game, apparently. One of my favourite comedians, David Mitchell, is pro-references, as he argues... Most 12-year-olds haven't heard of much, and they're going to hear of a lot less if TV refuses to tell them stuff. The whole experience of being a child is about hearing words, ideas, phrases and references you don't understand, and either working them out from context, asking someone, or looking them up. In his opinion, references inspire in us a curiosity to seek out the source material for ourselves. And in the modern age of Google and other technological conveniences, it's easier than ever to do so. I find myself flip-flopping on this point. On the one hand, pop culture has introduced me to more things than I can count. Somehow I know a lot about Sherlock Holmes despite never reading the stories, and one day I will sit down to read them all and fill in the gaps in my knowledge. Uh, pop culture introduced me to many classics and not-so-classics of the horror genre. Only occasionally has ingesting reference-heavy media dampened my enjoyment of the source material. The example I use all the time for this is Shaun of the Dead. This was one of the first zombie movies I saw, and pays a loving and amusing tribute to the subgenre as a whole. This happens to be a subgenre which has evolved over time, as our common understanding of what a zombie is has changed. Uh, originally, of course, zombies were a feature of Haitian folklore, and were revenant beings summoned by magic. I found this out by looking it up. Recently, there has been a surge of zombie media. The Walking Dead was an extremely popular- It's still going? Jesus Christ. The Walking Dead is, then, an extremely popular, somehow ongoing show about the creatures. My point is that when I finally watched George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead, a work that informed the genre, I was a tad underwhelmed. The zombies themselves were... undressed, there was no twist to them, no spice. 
The humans who just want to survive the movie are fine, and their power struggles were engrossing, but the zombies... I'd seen them rehashed too many times, and in a way, I was done with the movie before it even began. Now, Night of the Living Dead was released in 1968, which was a long time ago. Also fair game for spoilers, most people would agree. I'd love to be able to tell you that there is a cutoff line for acceptably established works of fiction, i.e. that something of a certain age can be openly discussed with anyone. But it's hard to know where to draw that line. I can't believe it. Bruce Willis is a ghost. I'm just, I'm shocked. Did you see that coming? After a while I started walking normally, I felt like Kaiser Sose from the end of The Usual Suspect. In other news, the chick in the crying game is really a man. <laughs> I mean, man, is that a good movie? Yay! To further complicate things, it's not only a matter of age, but of popularity. This applies more to TV shows than movies, but I've already heard numerous spoilers for Breaking Bad, The Walking Dead, Black Mirror, and Game of Thrones, and have only just embarked on one of them. People like Neville assume that if you haven't seen something already, then that's on you, and what are you even doing with your life if you're not watching Game of Thrones? And even if you avoid known spoiler fountains like Neville, you are likely to find them in other places. The spoilers, not Neville. I'll try to keep this to within horror, but it occurs everywhere. Horror is known for its iconic villains. They look cool, they say deliciously devilish things, and they make great Halloween costumes. Occasionally, the appearance of a horror movie antagonist is a spoiler in itself, especially in the case of slasher killers. The most obvious example here is Carrie. Distributors can't help themselves. On almost every poster and DVD cover, she is there, in her prom dress, covered in blood, and surrounded by fire. Similarly, the cover of Audition tells us something about the character Asami, although the movie starts out as a light romantic drama. The DVD cover of Saw 4 spoils the death of Jigsaw by showing his disembodied head on a set of scales. The Wicker Man spoils... the Wicker Man! Sometimes horror films divulge the details of other horror films. Oh, you want to watch Freddy vs. Jason? I hope you're up to date on both franchises, or you could learn some things before you mean to. Oh, the movie Scream was your first foray into horror? Well, congratulations, you just learned who the killer was in Friday the 13th. This is an interesting one, actually. Because Jason Voorhees is the poster boy for this franchise, you could be forgiven for thinking he's the killer in the first movie. It's almost a reverse spoiler for new arrivals, but I suppose Scream ruined even that small surprise. Perhaps such things are meant to reward horror stalwarts who grew up with horror. Most horror fans I talk to experienced it from a young age, but from the perspective of someone like me, it can be frustrating to learn of certain things before you have a chance to catch up for yourself. Receiving a spoiler is most appalling when you had been looking forward to deducing the various twists and turns of your newest book, film, or TV show. We want to know if our highest hopes or greatest fears are confirmed. We want to know if Laurie Strode is going to survive the second Halloween movie. We want to know if the children win out in Village of the Damned. This suspense is part of the joy of watching or reading something new. Sometimes. Have you ever turned to the last few pages of a book to see how it ends, and then started back at the beginning? Have you ever been so astounded by the events of a movie that you had to immediately rewatch it, and picked up all the foreshadowing and noticed how shiny the clues now appear? Sometimes the joy of a new story can come from knowing the conclusion and letting the story unfold to get us there. A couple of movies exist that have their scenes run in reverse chronological order. Christopher Nolan's Memento uses this narrative device because the protagonist has short-term memory loss. And each scene is self-contained for this reason. Because they're in reverse order, the audience is privy to a few things that our protag isn't. For example, that Natalie is lying to him about who attacked her. Another example is the French film Irreversible. We see Marcus attacking someone, then learn he is looking for his girlfriend's rapist. We see her get raped by someone who isn't the man who gets extinguished. And it just goes on and on, flashing back and giving the viewer a nice dose of dramatic irony. This all fits the message of the film, namely that time destroys everything and you can't turn back the clock. Knowing that this is a rape-revenge movie going in barely detracts from the movie's emotional impact. Interestingly, a single study has shown that perhaps knowing the end of a story is preferable. However, this is only one article, and as mentioned, it's hard to compare the spoiled and unspoiled experiences, as you only get one first-time experience of something. In recent news, the creators of the Westworld TV series intend to spoil the second season of their program, albeit in a contained fashion, i.e. a video that fans of season one could choose to ignore. Time will tell whether or not those in the know can keep their mouths shut among the more willfully ignorant, who may end up feeling jumpier as a result. 
At the end of the day, you may not mind spoilers, or you may live in fear of them. Just occasionally, I've encountered a spoiler that was such a revelation... Snape kills Dumbledore. ...that I had to exclaim loudly and walk around my bedroom for ten minutes. Would I have proceeded with the story even if Neville had let that detail slip beforehand? Absolutely. Whether or not you are surprised by leaked information, you shouldn't let it spoil your enjoyment. Let me know which side of the argument you're on, and thank you for watching this video essay. See you soon.